Here's Dana Gillespie in the Mercato Mayfair, which is right in the heart of London. And upstairs is a section of the Temple of Art and Music, which is a restaurant and occasionally music. Now, today I'm going to be talking to somebody that I have known since the 60s. In fact, he produced my second album in the 60s. And then I went on and did three more albums, one in each decade. So we worked together over four decades, 40 years, and actually probably longer than I've known him. But as he was a record producer, I learned lots of things from him and always think of him when I'm in the studios. And one thing he used to say to me is, put some bloody cutlery on to cover up, I mean, put a shawl on to cover up the sound of your glass bangles. That's how many years I've been doing this. So I'm doing this now, and this is thanks to my wonderful guest, Mike Vernon. Hello, Mike. Hi, Hi. You can say hello. Hello. <laughs> All those who are, All those who foolish, are watching. foolishly made the move to watch it. <laughs> yeah, now, I want, now, we go back a long way, Mike. Yeah, we so do. what I want to know is, how did, can I ask, I know it's boring, but it's not boring for the watchers. How did you start in the business? Um, I think it was out of frustration. I, I, I left school at 16 and I went to art college in Croydon. What and, year uh, are we talking we're about? We're talking, uh, well, I was born in 44, so uh, 16, so it would have been 1960. Is that right? Well, my maths oh, is bad. Don't ask well, me. Well, yeah, okay. well, I am asking you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. I, I think that's about right. Uh, you know, I would have been 16 when I left school. And I went to Croydon Art College thinking that, uh, you know, I was pretty good at uh, sketching and doing stuff like that. But I didn't really know the half of it, but I had one year of it, and I was not that good. And uh, I also found it incredibly boring. Um, a, lot, a lot of new model drawing and going out in the pissing rain, and, you know, drawing things you didn't really want to draw. Music's much I, more fun, isn't it? It was, and I'd, I'd, al I'd always been a huge music fan. Uh, my father was a big fan of uh, swing bands yeah. in the 40s, and really in a, indirectly, I suppose, I used to go with the family uh, on weekends. It wasn't a regular thing, it was sort of like maybe three or four times a year to a house uh, of one of his uh, wartime chums. And he had a quite a large collection of 78s. And amongst those were records by the Mills Brothers, the oh. Ink Spots, and Louis Jordan and the Timpani Five. And I, that was in the days when, you know, uh, uh, the, the record that he played a lot was Ain't Nobody Here But Us Chickens. And of course, at the, age of, at the age of eight, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you're not the only one. <laughs> the one I can't do is Saturday Night Fish Fry. No. There's so many verses, I, I don't think I it'll know. ever go in my brain. But, but uh, the Mills Brothers. Yeah. Oh. I, I had a lot of, I had quite a few Mills Brothers um, records. What was that one of theirs? Well, uh, um, my walking Million Dollar Baby. Million Dollar Baby. Well, that's yeah, also I good. I got a million dollar baby. At a five and ten cents store. And people Except probably <laughs> don't realise that the Mills Brothers didn't play instruments. No. They sang every instrument Absolutely. themselves. They did. Brilliant. Go and get the Mills yeah, Brothers album. Ma anyway, amazing. we digress because yes, we we're going to be digressing quite a bit. Yeah. So you were turned on to music. And then how did you yeah. get into the business? Because you were with Decca when I, I met I, you. Yeah, I mean, uh, after um, the full year of art college, I went back to college for the, to start yeah. the second year. And after about um, maybe six weeks, like the end of, yeah, yeah, end of September, I said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this anymore. I have to get into the music business. But by then, I had quite a large collection of records. I mean, they were all what everybody used to term as rock and roll records. But by then, I discovered that actually, if the, black, if the records were black, as we could say in those days, <laughs> Um, I don't think you can say it now. I, well, you can't say yeah. anything these days. I know, I know. Well, I'm saying it anyway. So, they're do <laughs> so am I. You know. um, I mean, I had a huge collection of records, including you know all the great ones like Little Richard and Fats. I mean, I had yards and yards of it. And I was discovered, of course, that actually it was rhythm and blues, not really rock and roll. So, rhythm and blues as we knew it then. Yes. Nowadays, it's you know usually well, it's somebody art, half art. naked wearing a bit of dental floss. I know, I know. But right. that's another story. It, 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 it is another story. <laughs> Don't want to know about that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said I, I have to do something else. I cannot stay in the art college anymore. So I wrote about uh, well, I wrote the same pleading letter and sent to the major six record companies as there were about six in those days. The two major ones were EMI and Decca. So those are the ones I was looking at, and I only got responses from I think three of them. And they were all negative, that we don't have any spaces at the moment, 
but if you're on file, uh, we'll get back to you. Well, about four weeks later, I got another, I got a response from Decker saying yes. they were now actually uh, interviewing for an assistant for the head of the artist and repertoire department. I thought, this is it. Well, of course, that's <laughs> known as A and R. Yeah. Or if you're in the business, you call them um and R because they may not know their art from their elbow. But that, I'm being very nasty. But that's all right. So you went. To, you're you being truthful. Yeah, but you went to Decca, and yes. I was signed to Decca. Well, I didn't know that, of course, at that time. No, well, I know because you were there before. You, know, you must and, have been hired. hired were you hired through? Hugh Mendel or Dick Rowe? Dick Rowe. Dick Rowe, the man um, who was the, famous the, for turning down the um, Beatles. But I always had a soft spot for him. But I like short, balding men who <laughs> like me. And the fact that they talk to your breast level is yeah, another right. matter. Yeah. But he was always very kind to me. And I know that when my first album was only released in America, he put me on to you. Mm -hmm. And you produced my second album yeah. with Savoy yeah. Brown. Oddly, oddly enough, I didn't know it was your second album. Isn't that weird? <laughs> I always thought it was the first one until I found out later that actually it wasn't. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why the hell I picked the boy Brown, but you see, actually, now I think about it, they were the right guys for the job because they had upgraded. They had Roger Earl and Tony Stevens on drums and bass. And Tony and, Stevens, and yeah, Lonesome well. Dave on. Um, what do you call it? And Kim Simmons. And Kim Simmons, of course, yeah, yeah you know. Um, and they were, well, uh, Roger and um, Tony were the beginnings of Fog Hat. I remember Fog Hat too, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't remember an awful lot about the record, except I, since I had it on CD, I mean, I still had the violin. Well, uh, all I can remember is that I had a couple of songs that had slightly oriental feel, and you had to desperately search for some somebody that played some weird, well, it seemed weird then, instrument to make what, it sound. What, what was the weird instrument? Oh, it, was some, it wasn't a shanai, but it was some sort of blowing thing. Okay. Um, but you cope with it well, but you, we <laughs> recorded the album in about two days, whereas I'd been weeks in the studios with a huge yeah, orchestra I, on the other one. I suspect, I thought it was maybe three days, but... It but, could have been three. The reason that would have happened was because the band themselves were very busy. Yeah. And Harry Simmons, who was their manager, yeah. wouldn't let them work in the studio any longer than that because it was taking, well, I, I, they were getting paid for doing it. But you were famous, as far as I was concerned, in the blues business because you formed that label, Blue Horizon, right. which was very rare for anyone to do that in those days. Well, it was more or less unheard of as far as Europe was concerned. I mean, there were a few that were hanging around at the very, in, the, in the early days that got in before us. I think Storyville might have been one of those in, in Denmark. But as far as the UK concerned, there were some very specialist labels that did a lot of reissues, but there weren't any labels that were specifically recording blues orientated material. And I think you were the only guy that was importing pe people from America, the black artists, yes. that were heroes to you know the Absolutely. blues lovers over here, what? who probably didn't, couldn't even get arrested no, I mean, over I, there. I, I took two big chances at Decca because I persuaded, uh, actually, frankly, for the, the first project was Curtis Jones, who nobody really had ever heard of, who was a Texas uh, bar, bar room pianist singer with quite a high pitched voice. Did an album with him, and then I did an album with Champion Jack Dupree, and Fabulous. then I did an album with Otis Spann, uh. which was a benchmark because the rhythm section was um, Willie Smith, Ransom Nolan, and none other than Muddy Waters, who wasn't allowed to sing or play slide, which of course he did. Because of uh, <laughs> contractual reasons. Yeah, he was, uh, he was called Brother on the record. All right, well, of course, Otis Spann is for me the hero of piano. I saw, yeah. I saw Muddy Waters with Pine Top Perkins mm -hmm. later, but I never saw Otis Pan. Or if oh, I did, well. I don't really remember it. You, I was very uh, young. That's a shame, because although Pine Top Perkins was a very, a very good pianist not and, the, and a good singer, he not Span like was Otis the Pan. man, let's face it. He was but, but, didn't, but you were also responsible for bringing in people, I mean, mixing the black artists with the white, sort yeah. of, you're like your Peter Greens yeah. or... we did that with Fleetwood Mac when we went to yeah. Chicago. They were on tour in America. And I was able to get a couple of days, well, actually it was only a day, uh, in the Termar Studios, which is Chess's studio, like the newer one, the bigger one, in Chicago. And we had S.P. Leary and Mick Fleetwood on drums and the rest of the band, but we brought in Shaky, Hort, uh, Shaky Horton, Buddy Guy, who didn't actually play very much. That's another story, why yes. he didn't. Right, there's plenty um, of stories about JT, Buddy Guy. Uh, JT Brown, who was Elmore James's sax player. 
you know, I mean, the band, I mean, Jeremy really enjoyed it. Jeremy enjoyed it, and I think Peter enjoyed it up to a point. The other guys, like John McVie, John McVie had no idea what was going on. I seem <laughs> to remember, though, an album that was released in England. Was it with Muddy Waters and was it with, I don't know, uh, Eric Clapton or those lot? That was, that was probably, that wasn't Electric Mud, was it? I can't, I can't remember. I was hoping you might remember. Um, there, there, are, I, there is an album of the type you're talking about. It's, it's an album I don't have, actually, on you. I only have the real Muddy Waters. <laughs> oh, right. How long did Blue Horizon function as a label, and why did you give well, it, it really up? Well, it really only it functioned for very, I don't think, any longer than four years. It was uh, distributed by CBS originally. Uh, and that was a, a deal that was supposed to have run long, but we had a, a major hiccup with the artist contract with Fleetwood Mac. We, we inadvertently had not noticed that the contract had run out. Oh dear. And it was a major, <laughs> yes, and say, oh dear, not exactly the words I used at the time. <laughs> and we just, uh, and Albatross had been number one, and we were halfway through recording Man of the World when uh, the charming Clifford Adams. Cliff Davis, who was my agent yeah, yeah, yeah. at Starlight Artists. Yeah, well, yes. Skim, skim over no, the name. Pass over that. Um, I, but I never had a problem with him, yeah. but others did. We had some major problems. Um, and he said, finish making Man in the World and you can put it out. Yeah. Which was a damn lie, because we'd never got it. It went out on immediate. Immediate never paid Fleetwood Mac which was, uh, I, I thought was rather funny. Well, uh, the immediate was, of course, was Andrew Lloyd, uh, yeah. Andrew, not Lloyd, uh, Andrew Lou Golden, yeah, and yeah. I was signed to immediate as a, yeah. Tony Calder, yeah. as I was signed I as had, a songwriter. I had a, an issue with them too. Well, there it wasn't an issue. I, um, it was that John Mayall had left, but he hadn't, he, he, he first signed with Decker. He made one album with Decker, and then he made a single with Eric Clapton for immediate. And, and John told me at a later date, he said, I'm so glad I didn't make any more records with those bastards. <laughs> but you know... Because yeah, they didn't understand the music. They had no, no There might have been troubles and things, but everyone was kind of fiddling around in a fog. I mean, they were. I think everyone did it for the love of the music yes, I, more I, than... I know I did. We didn't make an awful lot of money out of it. Well, same, <laughs> same here. I you mean, did it because you loved it. It's not to say that we didn't do well. We did, we did you know, with Fleetwood Mac, we did very well. But because of that contract problem, uh, we lost you know, Man of the World. Sony were about to sue us. Well, it wasn't Sony then, it was still CBS. Yeah. They, uh, we, they claimed that we were in collusion with the band management, which was not true. Uh, Seymour Stein kind yes. of helped to get us out of that fix. And we got a new distributorship with uh, Polydor. And that lasted for just around about two years. And we put out some pretty good records and made a few uh, reissues. Did some good stuff with a band called Jelly Brain, which was oh, I remember them. Band. But by this time, Blue Horizon, you'd sort of folded it, it down. It kind of did. The only thing that kept it running for about an extra eight months was uh, the fact that we put Focus out. Their very first album, Moving them. Waves, came yeah. out on Blue Horizon. Do you so, remember? Well, we wrote, <laughs> co-wrote with Mo Whittam and David Malin, Rest in Peace, because he's up there in that, you know, songwriter's heaven. We wrote Where Blue Begins, and in the bridge in the middle, you probably don't remember. I'm sure I do. That there's one line where I wrote, here's the pillow that my right. head lies on. Yeah. Now, something or other, in the blue horizon, I felt so proud of myself to mention yeah. that name. It's a, it's, a, it's a cool name to use, you know. It, it is, uh, it is actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually on my last album uh, with the Mighty, Com Mighty Combo, my own band. We had a song called um, Love Affair with the Blues, and Blue Horizon gets involved, in, uh, it, it, you know, it's beyond the Blue Horizon, which will be what will be on my gravestone, hopefully. The, he went beyond the Blue Horizon. Yes. I just wrote a song on a new album, and, and I wanted to call it Beyond the Blue Horizon, but I, there's many others, so I called it Way Beyond the Blue Horizon, and there's beyond, no yeah, way, yeah. because it's, you know, you look at the I, listings. I, I have a photograph that's sitting, hanging around, it's on Facebook actually as well, and I thought it would make the, a, a great photograph for the front of my book that I was going to write called Beyond the Blue Horizon. Have you not but written your I book? I haven't written my book, Dana, and, um, and I'm not going to write the everything thing because I am so tired of people saying to me, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I'm going to say, look, I have done so many interviews and I've had so many things written about me, which is all very nice, very nice. But I've got nothing left to tell. 
it's, yeah. it's, you know. But except, well, I, I kept sharing that too, and then I finally bought my book out last year, and I'm quite pleased I finally got it out. Yeah, but well. it's a tough old, it's a tough thing to be sitting at the computer, and the last thing you want to think about, about is. Tell me about it. So yeah. after all of this, then what happened when you, because we kind of, I didn't see you for a while, except that occasionally well, you would float in. I became independent. Yes, you were, and, and you had Chipping Norton Studios with your yes, brother. But, yeah, but that, which was that, a great studio. It was, that was residential, that was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Yes, that was re, that, a direct result of um, the financial gains we made with the record label. Oh, right, we yeah. decided to invest it in something that was a bit <laughs> had a bit more chance that it wouldn't go, go under again. You know. I always remember you were recording Joanne Kelly, who. You know, oh, right, younger yes. people probably won't remember, but she yeah. was our main blues singer in those. Yes, and you said that when she got, I remember you told me we were working on something, tumor. and she had a brain tumor, yeah. and she was playing and couldn't find. She came the chords. to the studio with Dave, her brother, yeah. and he was desperate to uh, try and record some things with her before it got to the point where she just couldn't cope with it, and it, yeah. and it, we didn't really get anything. Otherwise Dave Kelly still works. I mean, you know, yeah, he's, they, he's, I mean, he's out on the road always. All the time. He's a lovely man. Yeah. yeah. A lot of time of the day. And there's some good old boys, you know, that are still around, like Dave Peabody and people like no, that. No, Peabody's you still know, around, yes. Yeah, you know, they, uh, Big Joe Lewis, he's still, mind you, he's younger than Dave. Big Joe Lewis, I've got a gig with him in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, he's lovely. Life. No, yeah. I will indeed. Yeah. You know, because he, I like the old style blues. Yeah. I'm not really interested in rock blues, no, and I'm no. fed up with people I'm, saying there's a blues band, and they're not, they're a no, bloody they're not, rock no. band. No, well, I've got, I've, I've formed a new band in Spain. Yes, tell us about your uh, new band. Uh, uh, well, it's going back to uh, old school blues. It's going to be, you know, don't expect any real histrionics. It, it, uh, think more like John Brim and Jimmy Rogers and Yay. yeah, Muddy. You know, Called what? You know. I haven't given this name out yet, but by the time you show this, it probably will be out on Facebook. Uh, we're going to be called Cat Squirrel. The Cat and Squirrel? Cat, no, Cat Squirrel. Cat Squirrel? Yes. Okay, yeah, Cat and Squirrel sounds like a Na pub. Well, cat Squirrel sounds like... Na named after a song written and recorded by Dr. Isaiah Ross, the one-man band from Memphis. Okay. Also covered by Cream on their only out on their very first album. Um, and uh, so... It features uh, yours truly singing, my Spanish guitarist Kid Carlos, yeah. harmonica player uh, Mingo Balaguer, and uh, Oriol, I can't pronounce his surname, on drum, <laughs> on bass, <laughs> upright bass, and uh, Pascual on drums from Madrid. So it's fun. I mean, it's, it's got to be fun. It's fun. It's going to be fun, and it's going to be unashamedly and unapologetic. But you had a Hardcore. hit. Some when, when what era was that hit? Weren't you Rocky Sharp and the Razors? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, now, that was in the late late seventies, in the early eighties. Because you did lots I, of doo wop singing. I did. I did. There's I, nothing I, like a bit of doo wop. Absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, Trevor Church of the Ace, who, who, who of course. Hey, well, I've been with Ace for years. Weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted to make a single with Rocky Sharp and the replays. And that, uh, Trevor had had this thing about recording Rama Lama Ding Dong. He yes. said it's, it's a hit record, it's a hit song that, that nobody knows about. So I want to do it with Rocky Sharp and the replays because the razors have broken up. They came oh, right. okay. the darts and, and the replays darts became... Darts was a great band yeah, in very, its very day. Good, very good band. So we did, we did Ram Lam and Ding Dong, but when we recorded it as a single, Pete Wingfield, who was playing piano on it, we didn't really have anybody in the group to sing the baritone part. So Pete said, in discussion, he said, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I can do that, you know, ram a lamb, ram a lamb, a ding dong, ram a said, great, fine, you know. And of well, course, nobody thought that the record was going to be a hit. And it was. And it was a hit. And then <laughs> everybody wanted Pete to come and do TV, and he flatly refused. Yeah. Because he just started his career as a producer. Yeah. And he was having a hit with uh, 16 with a bullet. Oh, right. Which was a quite a big hit in America. Not yeah. so Remind much me who, who did that? Oh, that was 10cc. No, who no, was no, it? No, no, it was his own song. Oh, it was his own, but yeah. he, got, he went out as Pete Winfield? He went out as Pete Winfield, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, my so, memories. so then we, we actually um, tried a lot of uh, baritone and bass singers, and uh, we really came up against a real problem, you know, because I yeah. am very, very uh, <laughs> particular about yeah. that sort of thing. It, it's one thing to be able to sing the part, but does it swing? Does yeah. it swing inside the track? And yeah. they didn't. It didn't. It was like the proverbial bloody lead. <laughs> like this. And right. I said, "No, this guy's no good. That guy's no good." And I actually 
<laughs> I had jo Jan, who was Ro Rocky's brother. Yeah. Was, you know, Rocky was long yeah. since passed away, I think. Um, Haven't they all? Yeah, I know. Um, and um, <clears throat> tried to do it and um, just wouldn't switch. I said, OK, I'll go in the studio and show you how it's supposed to be. So I got out in the studio and I sang it exactly the way it was supposed to be. And that it virtually was the version that was used on the record. And Rocky right. said, why are we having all these auditions? Why are you just bloody do it? <laughs> well, I know you did some, so, you know. some what we call in the business, BVs, <coughs> backing vocals on some of my... I think you were on Sweet Meat and we had Bob yep. Paul on piano. Yep. Yep. And I always remember you said there was one thing you would do it do a dirty up or you know quite clever lyrics which are a bit naughty yeah. but when you've got all the vocals in it's you know yeah. i'm so pleased it's, that you're here because you don't live in england anymore do no you? i don't no, i haven't lived in england permanently for uh, 22 years so i knew that i had to grab mike while he was here otherwise he might be gone again until you're back for some more gigs maybe. well i don't know whether i'm going to do any gigs in england i mean you know there's no money in england you know, well, and, and that's an issue, you know, because, because the reason I stopped the Mighty Combo is it was costing me a ruddy fortune. I know, but you had great musicians, you had Garrett Watkins, well, did, and you yes. had Martin Winning. And yeah, but, but you see, they, they were kind of, you know, a little yeah. bit on the... Well, you know, people... <laughs> I had also... a couple of replacements who were, who, were, who were up to it. But at the end of the day, we got to a point where... Um, we actually started to get the right gigs and where we started to get some halfway decent money. And then Brexit came along and then yeah. COVID came along. I know, it's, it's damaged the whole lot. But I'm yeah. really thankful, Mike, that you could come in and talk well, to me I on Globetrotting. I wasn't a big, I only come from Kingston. <laughs> I know, so he trailed in. And, and we're, when we finish here, we're going to actually eat because, of course, here in the Temple of Art and Music upstairs at Mercato, they got pretty good food. So I want to thank you very much, You're very Mike. And, and we'll probably, you know, we play a bit of music at the beginning and the end. We might as well do Where Blue Begins so people can hear what we did. Why and, not? Unless you particularly want something else. No, I'm quite happy to go along with that. Well, let me know when Cat Squirrel is, you know. Climb well, the I, tree. I do occasionally go overseas to do globetrotting because right. I'm often overseas. So I'll try and find you again. Well, I'm in Malaga. Right. Not the city. I'm, okay. out the, I'm out in the boonies, up in the mountains. Well, I want to thank Mike Vernon very much for coming in and thank You're you welcome. for being on Globetrotting. Thank you guys out there for watching. Now I can take my, um, I can you, expose my cutlery you, and make a lot of noise. You, you can bangle away. Yes, but you <laughs> used to teach me so many good tricks in the studios. But anyway, from us both, thanks and goodbye. Bye. That's where